dynamite delight. I will tell you, when you look at this show, it was good. It actually was pretty decently good. Building more into All In, it was not that bad. I don't agree with absolutely everything there, but at least they are putting more effort into the storytelling than the matches themselves. And that is one of the major problems that I found AEW has been having for quite a while here. They have been heavy with the matches. That really didn't mean anything. Now they put more emphasis on the storylines. And the match quality has not dropped that much. Which is good. That's at least something we can say that we got here. Let's open with a eliminator match. MJF versus Kyle Fletcher. Now, let's make it clear. Was this a good match? Yes. Seeing MJF spit in the face of a Kyle Fletcher partway into the match helped that match. And this is showing you why MJF is money. Let's make this clear. This could have been just an ordinary eliminator match. A eliminator match that we've seen multiple times, not because MJF has been doing multiple eliminator matches, is that that's what AEW does. We've been getting the same thing in WWE for many years before now they became TKO WWE and they're not doing that much anymore. At least when it doesn't mean anything. Here in AEW, they did it a lot. Eliminator match, eliminator match, eliminator match. It's garbage. I hate them. But I will say in this match, because of how good MJF is in enticing and in angering the fans and making that other person look gold because he just raised the stock of a Kyle Fletcher. He just did. It helped him a lot. Yes, he lost. Yes, he got his head cut open by the dynamite diamond ring. Yes, he was about to get the Tiger Driver 91 until we got a little bit of Will Osprey saving him and then we wonder who blocked the door to a Will Osprey. I already believe I already know. Now, if I am correct in my assumption, and I don't think anybody else is going to agree with me, but this is my assumption. The person who blocked the door of Will Osprey was Don Collis. It was not MGF. It was Don. Don blocked the door for one simple reason, that he wants the American champion on his team. That's what he wants. He wants gold, and I believe that the American champion, MJF, would be the proper one to go for. Not saying this is going to happen, but that would be the best guess. This is just me. Next, Mariah May versus Viva Van. Let me give you like this. I have seen Viva Van, I believe, once a long time ago. She looked interesting, but I didn't see her since. Then we get her against Mariah May, who basically whooped that ass very handedly. Fine. But what made and understand this, this, this feud is the best feud they have. I'm being honest here. Taking away from what's going on with MJF and with Osprey, and you already know what's been going on with Britt Baker, and I will get to Britt and Camille and the, the Mercedes Monet in a few minutes. But I'm going to be honest here. One of the best stories so far they built that's in-house properly has been Mariah May and my taste is Tony Storm. Because what did we get after that match is over? We get Mariah May getting surprised by a picture that says, Die, Mariah, die, and starts getting beaten up by a... My, my Tony Storm. Look, let's make this clear. This is one of the best built stories we got. We got a homegrown, built, tasteless Tony Storm. She has been built from the ground up. She is so well built. She doesn't need a title. If she loses her title, she's not going to get hurt. She doesn't need it to define her. The title needed her to define it. And handing it over to Mariah May if they go there will not hurt anything. But Mariah May has been built with Tony Storm. 
And this story is one of the best ones they have for the women I've seen in, in over two years. Two years. Saying it again. This story is one of the best ones ever built in two years. Compared to every other story. Sandra Rosa and Britt Baker. Soraya and Britt Baker. What you had with Ruby Soho. I'm sorry. None of them is good as this. And even though it is kind of a short build. And I know you're going to say, no, it's not. Yes, it is. Because the story has progressed much better because of Peppermint and whoever else is helping, particularly one who came from TNA. You know there's a writer from TNA who's now working with AEW. So he is, I'm sure, helping the men, but also if Peppermint needed some help, he can go to her as well. So this is the best build the women has ever had in two years. Now, do I care about what happened with Sabata? And Brian Keefe. No. And I have not seen the video of... Of... Well. Look. I'm not bored of the storyline that's going on with the learning tree. I'm sure Alex is not interested. I have not seen his video yet. I have not watched it. So I don't want to know what he says. I haven't had a chance to see it. I'm eventually going to see what he thinks... About what's going on with Chris Jericho. Is he becoming dull? If he's his, he can't. He's out of touch. As far as I can tell, when it comes down to it, it's not about being out of touch. When you look at the learning tree and how many times before the learning tree that Chris had to change over and over and over again, the major problem Chris Jericho has is not that he's become dull and boring and he doesn't know how to touch the the fans anymore. He has the same problem that John Moxley had. He needs to go away. That's the deal. A lot of times people are overexposed for so long, they need to take a break. And Chris Jericho's time has come. He needs to take a break. It's not about if the story is bad or not. It's that he's been used so much. He's oversaturated the entire situation. Now, I'm hoping when All In is done... He goes away for a little while because that's what we need for him right now. I'm hoping with, with John Moxley, he stays away for a couple of months. He doesn't come back. He's not working in New Japan. He's not working GCW. He just takes a break, spends time with his daughter whenever a, a well, that, let's make it very clear. His lovely wifey that is currently working, Renee Marquette, takes a break as well, at least when she takes a few days or weeks off. Which will be fine. Let someone else there. Let um, Alicia have the interviewing for a little while. And let her work for a little bit. And let Renee take a break. Be with her husband. Be with her, her daughter. And give them a break. But that's what Chris also needs. He needs a break. Not because he's burnt out. It's just he's oversaturated. In the end, we get Sabata tapping out Brian Keefe. Brian Keefe is done. We get Sabata getting beat up. And in the end, who comes back? Hook. But here's where I'm bored. Here's where it's not working for me. I'm sorry, guys. If you're into this with Hook dealing with Chris Jericho, fine. I'm glad for you. I'm all in for you. No pun intended. But for me personally, the story has to be Chris versus Taz. I know there's never going to be a match unless... Taz is cleared, and I have not heard him being cleared, and they're going to keep using Hook for the situation, but I'm going to be honest here. At this point, it's not working with me when it comes to Hook. It's just not. Hook should have already moved away from the FCW title, and he's not, and there's the problem. He needs to move away from it. It should move on to someone else, but they're not doing it, and if they're not going to be able to let Taz get in the ring. If Taz is physically still with his neck, unable to wrestle. This story needs to end it all in. This story needs to end that Hook wins the damn title and they retire it. Because as long as he has that title around his neck, he is not going to progress to the American Championship or International Championship when it switches back, whenever that happens. The TB. TNT Championship, which he should progress there eventually after All In. By the end of the year, he should start working on TNT. But if he's not going to, 
that damn thing's like a noose around his neck. And if he's not going to move away from that title, it needs to be retired and let him start working RH. Let him win the pure championship. If there's nothing else for him to do, let him win the pure title. I'm sorry. He's well trained enough that the pure title would actually work with him. Like with Rita Yuta. He should just do that. Moving on. And let me give it to you like this. Did I care about this trio's championship? Well, not not the championship. But how do I feel about this? The international champion, the all Atlantic champion, Orange Cassidy with the two-time former champions, FTR dealing with Roosh, the former Black Taurus, and Roderick Strong. Do I actually care? No, I don't. Since the storm's going on, we don't have Mark Briscoe and we don't have Kyle O'Reilly. They had to have FTR fill in. The ones I should care about, which I sh should hear more about, Roosh, Roderick Strom, and what is, what is Black Tourist's name again? Morto. Beast Morto. If I'm pronouncing his name right, I don't even remember. I'd rather see him as Black Tourist. He sounds better as Black Tourist. But you get my point. It's not about the match quality. I care about them more than I care about FTR and Orange Cassidy. And this wasn't even about trying to make sure that Orange Cassidy continues trying to build in the trios with the conglomerate. Because what did we get? The acclaim coming out, getting angry at FTR, having an attitude, and they're trying to beat the crap out of each other. This is what we got. Moving on. Okay. Hmm. Let me give it to you like this. Camille versus two jobbers. Who she destroyed. I'm not surprised. Look, I'm one of the few people who reviewed NWA Power. I think I'm one of the few people who ever did review it. Because some people reported on it. I reviewed it. When it was back in 2019, 2020, and tried to do 2021, and even into a little, maybe a little bit of 2022, I don't remember, either 2021 into 2022, and then I stopped because I noticed that the product was off, and that's when Nick Aldis left. The product has not been the same. Now, admittedly, I haven't seen the product in over a year and a half, so I don't know how much of a change it was. I saw when was it? Sign what was the name of it? The, the product. What was the product name? Um, Swahind. I believe that was the name of the pay-per-view they had. Where pretty much we got a Father Mitchell doing coke. Real coke. Or fake coke. Snorting that mess. I don't even know if it was real or fake. He was just doing it and people did not like it. Since then I haven't watched it. In fact, I don't even know where I can watch it. Because I don't have the, the funds to start getting different streaming services just to see one show. I'm on a fixed budget. That's the deal for me. But, I've known Camille for quite a while when she became the insurance policy of Nick Aldis. She has it. As a former, I believe she was a former linebacker. A women's football linebacker. She's not a small woman. She knows how to do the damn business. And seeing that she's CEO's insurance policy makes perfect sense. The talk wasn't that bad. And they did include the actual suspension. If you don't know when they were talking about a suspension, look at my past Gump Report. You'll see it on my, on my channel. I talk about the Gump Report. Well, in the Gump Report, I talk about why she was suspended. And that she got... A little smack on the wrist and lost four grand in the process of running a mouth due to the fact she was not happy that the one hour run of Will Ospreay and MGF where I know her and MGF used to be friends at least a year, a year and a half ago and they stopped being friends now and due to Alicia Tone hearing her talk shit about her man and Will Ospreay tells her man and she finds out that she told her man and basically badmouth Alicia and her man basically. I'm just 
making it condensed. You should see the full video, but you get my point. This was what she did. But they did address it. And then we get a little bit of Brit on the Titantron talking about she, well, Tony said simply, Tony Schiavone, that the suspension's lifted, all in is still on. She gets on the Titantron, she says, I don't know what I'm going to do to you, but I'm going to get you for what it is. You thought this match wasn't going to happen. It's going to happen. Fine. Okay. Do I believe this is going to be good? Yeah. Do I believe something's going to happen when you see Camille saving the match? Yep. But I'm not going to tell you who wins because, honestly, I'm not trying to think that far. It could be easily obvious who's supposed to win, but I'm not thinking about who could win. It's about how they're going to structure the match and how Camille is going to be in, integrated into it. She's the insurance policy. How is the insurance policy going to work against Brit? That's what I want to know. Moving on. Final match. And if I'm missing anything, I'm sorry. Final match. We get Jeff Jarrett. Versus Brian Danielson. And this is 100% about setting up for him and Swerve. Not a Jeff Jarrett, but a Brian Danielson. Vid Pack was good. I liked the Vid Pack. Wasn't bad. And what did we get? And I know I'm I'm really not going to talk about the interview with JR and Swerve. I'm going to leave that out. I'm actually going to leave it out. Not because I didn't watch it, because I did, and Swerve did talk well. But I don't really need to emphasize any more than what needs to be done. It is now on Brian Danielson to prove that he can make this work. This is about him. Not about Swerve's interview trying to convince people that he can do it. It's about Brian Danielson if he can handle it. So that's why I'm not going to really talk much about that. Was the match good? Yes. In fact, this is one of the rare times you can see Jeff... Doing a very good job putting over Brian Danielson. Yes, could he be a little over embellishing it? Yes, of course, it's Jeff. Jeff has always done that. But I'm being honest here. Jeff did do a pretty good job. And with that boo cycle knee, with the chair that cut him near his ear, I believe it was near his ear, his ear got cut because of the boo cycle knee into the chair, which probably cut it. He did good. Then Swerve comes out, as I'm not surprised. Then we got Swerve talking to Brian Danielson about what he did. Feeling, is he a little wobbly? Because Brian's knee got a little banged up a little bit. He, his hand being a little tickly. It, it was done well. Basically, throwing a little bit what was in the interview at Brian Danielson himself. It was fine. The question is going to be, how far are they going to go with this match to make it look good? I don't know who's going to win the match. And to be honest, I don't want to know. I don't want to know who wins because when it comes to all in in this particular match, the story sells itself. We got Swerve who's on the top of his game who really is going to make things work very well. And then you got Brian Danielson who legitimately said that I'm ready to retire. I want to retire, make things work. And to be honest, in real life, if he wants to retire, he's going to work in the back. And he's going to make things work better for the company. But before he does, either he's going to have a short run with a title or he's done at all in and we don't see him in the ring anymore. And he may become a manager as much as he may be uh, an agent in the back. The story sells itself. We will see either someone become champion for the first time from this company or we will finally see someone retire and is Perfectly satisfied going out the way he did because, let's be honest, TKO WWE was not going to give him what he wanted. Brian Danielson would never have a proper run ever again because of how badly his neck was and because of the changing landscape of what has happened being TKO WWE. They want this even more than Vince did. Vince was, let's make this clear, and I did see an article talking about the denial from... The, um, what was it again? The motion to deny the information that is being requested from the plaintiff. Let me just give you like this. I do know about it. I'm not going to make a video on it, but I do know about it. Let's make this clear about Vince. Vince had gotten 
almost everything he wanted but one thing. He wanted total control and he didn't want to hear anything from the shareholders, from anybody. He wanted the show just to be the way he wanted. He was making the money he wanted and he was making even more money on top of that. But at that point in his 70s, he just wanted it the way he wanted. He didn't care if you liked it or not. You better like what I like or fuck you. That's what he was saying to the fans. We're not doing that anymore. Brian Danielson would have never gotten very far with Vince due to the fact of the liability. He didn't want to deal with it anyway because not saying he hated Brian Danielson, but why would he care? Here, it's not about that he's hated. It's the point that Triple H is the figurehead of TKO WWE. He's the front man for the company. He just is. All this talk about him this is a Triple H era. It's not. Triple H will only do what Ari Emanuel allows him to do. Ari tells him to go somewhere. He's going to go somewhere. It doesn't make a difference if you like it. Look how Prime is being pushed. Look how many advertisements went on during SummerSlam. We had, what, three hours of nothing but talk. It didn't even need to be that on. It probably was on because the pay-per-view being that long... Brings in more money for TKO WWE. So Brian Danielson would never get very far in TKO WWE because it's way more orientated towards money. So he's getting the ending he wants if he doesn't win. But he's still getting the ending he wants if he does win. Because now he could get a run that could be the way he wants. And the creative freedom he wants where it wouldn't be. But it's just me. Peace.